Hi everybody, this video is sponsored by a contribution from Stella and this is what she wants you to know. Ali, thank you my friend for having the courage to tell your story. Every video you post brings me to healing tears. You don't know me but you have changed my life in such a profound way. No amount of money could ever repay you for helping me regain my sanity. You saved my life and you continue to educate me with your selfless acts of generosity to the narcissistic community. Thank you. My story begins with mom. She was a dirt poor girl from Puerto Rico. She was one of 13 kids born to abusive parents. And to me, having 13 kids itself is abuse. Because there's no way a mother and father can care for 13 kids. That in and of itself is just abusive. Her mother, my grandmother, died of tuberculosis when she was only nine years old. She spoke of sexual abuse and horrific beatings with that, with what she called a switch from a tree. She remembers my grandmother crying while my grandfather continued to have sex with her while she was on her deathbed. Oh my God. My mom eventually left Puerto Rico with a third grade education. She was sent to live with her aunt and her older sister in New York. And you know, <laughs> I hate to say this, but this is what Charlene talks about, about Dominican Republic, how there is just, it's just excused there. You know, the sexual abuse and all that. It's just excused. And, you know, it's a dirt poor cult, it's a dirt poor culture to begin with. And, you know, growing up with narcissists and then being down there in that culture, it, it, it was horrible for her. And this is something she's very sensitive about is, is the excusing, um, uh, the excusing nature in, in this culture. And, it's devastating because really there was nobody your mother could have told at that point because it's very hush hush overall in that society. I mean, it's one thing, you know, in America, narcissists or sexual abuse to children is taken pretty seriously. In those countries, it's just not. And it sure as hell wasn't when your mother was a kid. My aunt was extremely abusive. She would punch and slap my mother on a regular basis. She once broke her nose for not having dinner on the table when she walked through the door. My mom started visiting a distant cousin and she invited her on a road trip with a much older man. He was a truck driver for the Teamsters Union. They traveled from New York to California. Her cousin met someone and she left mom with this much older man who later became my dad. Mom was 18, a virgin, and barely spoke, <clears throat> barely spoke English. She told me Dad forced himself on her and violently raped her. She became pregnant with my golden child brother. Dad then apologized and promised to marry her since she was pregnant. He was 30 years older. Dad had a friend marry them and told Mom the marriage certificate would come in the mail. She checked the mail daily for years, but it never came. Dad said it probably got lost in the mail. And Mom, the Edith, Edith Bunker type, believed him. Um, minus the age difference, that's very similar to some stories Charlene tells. Very similar. Because in that culture, it's just, it's like sexually the word no doesn't, doesn't exist to a lot of these men. And, and, and that's the reality. It's just like they're, they're entitled to your body. Now, in Puerto Rico, I mean, Puerto Rico is a uh, territory of the United States, but I mean, I don't know what it was like back then, but that culture, I mean, that is real. And you know, Charlene will tell you firsthand about it, and it's bad, and it's, you know, she, she refers it to it as this, 
this Latino machismo is just like they 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 just have a right to your body and you know it, it's really bad the way the, the way she talks about it and and you could tell how damaging it is it is for her and when you I guess when you come from that culture I mean even though you're living in the United States you don't even think to to to, to speak out or or or, or seek help because I mean that's just not what you've been indoc indoctrinated in, you know. But it's like that for all narcissists, any, uh, for all narcissist survivors, anyway. Um, you know, it's just a tough situation. Four years later, my uh, scapegoat brother was born. Mom became very ill. She had been bitten by a mosquito as a child, infecting her with the malaria virus. It can stay dormant in your body for years and wreak havoc on your internal organs. U.S. doctors were not familiar with this type of illness, as it is rare in the U.S. They finally took her in for emergency surgery and removed her spleen, gallbladder, appendix, and a large part of her liver to save her life. While, while mom is healing, dad gives golden child brother the responsibility of raising my scapegoat brother. They are four years apart. While in his care, my scapegoat brother, who already has some kind of mental issue, gets hit by a car on two different occasions riding his bike home from school. He spends the next two months in a body cast. Shortly after, golden child brother breaks scapegoat brother's arm. By now, dad has gone from truck driver business agent for the Teamsters and Lions Union, local 305. I was told he was a work, workers' comp attorney. He was earning a thousand per week in the 60s. Everyone loved dad. I've been told he went out of his way for strangers. When it came to his own family, we lived on the bare minimum. The boys' school shopping consisted of two pairs of pants and two shirts for the entire school year. Dad had a gambling addiction and spent most of his time at the office and the casino. He also had two other families he was supporting. Two other women, each with a child, one boy, one girl. Dad's son from his first marriage was, was mom's age. My scapegoat brother told me he would, off, he would visit often and get into horrible fights with dad. Fifteen years after Golden Crowd brother was born, mom gets pregnant with me. She desperately wants an abortion. Dad, the nice guy he was, had many grateful friends he had gotten jobs for in the union. Tony and Isabel, a wonderful couple, heard the unfortunate situation my parents found themselves in and offered to adopt me at birth so mom would not have to have an abortion. I met Isabel when I was 30 years old and she, and she revealed the secret. She told me dad accused mom of sleeping with his son and mom said she was embarrassed to be pregnant by, my, by dad. She didn't want anyone to know she was still having sex with an old man. I still don't know the truth. My scapegoat brother has agreed to a DNA test just recently. For 16 years, I lived with the elephant in the room that my half-brother may actually be my real dad. Isabel and Tony bought, bought baby clothes, decorated a nursery, and we were anxiously awaiting my arrival. They rushed to the hospital. They rushed to the hospital to pick up their soon-to-be adopted baby girl. Sadly, Isabel and Tony were heartbroken. Mom and Dad changed their mind. Throughout the years, this lovely couple sent me money gifts and beautiful greeting cards. I was led to believe they were my godparents. Isabel told, told me my godparents were actually my aunt and uncle on my mother's side. I was always told Isabel and Tony were my godparents, so imagine I'm the shock when I found out the truth. I confronted mom with the information and she had a deer in the headlights look, but adamantly denied ever wanting to give me up for adoption. She was 65 at the time and I just left the subject alone. We moved from California to Puerto Rico when I was a year old. My brothers left California kicking and screaming. They left friends, school, and their entire life behind. Dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer and wanted to spend his final years in Puerto Rico. My first eight years of my life are very blurry. I only remember bits and pieces. I, I always wondered why that is. 
Most people I know can describe most of their childhood, at least from five years old on up. I remember my mother being extremely depressed. I was always making her life a living hell. My behavior, according to everyone, was horrible. I was often slapped in the face or hit with an old tree switch till my legs were bleeding. Golden, Golden Child Brother said, it didn't count unless you were bleeding. I remember Playboy magazines in the basket in the restroom reading material for my dad and brothers. Since my, since my brothers were so much older, it was like having four parents. They were told to discipline me anytime they wanted. They micromanaged everything I did and also had fun torturing me and making me cry. My golden child brother would pinch me with his toes so his hands were visible. And when I cried out in pain, he could say I was lying. They both wiped burgers on me and had tons of fun farting in my face. I remember dad yelling and screaming at the boys, calling them bums, lazy, fresh, good for nothing blockheads. Son of a bitch was one of his favorites. Nobody was safe from dad's verbal and physical abuse, not even golden child brother. Mom gave her fair share of beatings as well with the tree switch and the sh and the chanclita, Spanish for sandal. We sat at the dinner table like statues forced to eat anything on our plates. I remember reaching for a biscuit at breakfast without asking dad first. He was at the head of the table, table reading, his, reading the newspaper. It was like he sat there waiting for us to mess up. As soon as my hand touched the biscuit, he hit my little hand with such force it took my fingernail right off. I remember the blood dripping onto the plate full of biscuits. Mom jumped up and started yelling at him. These are sadistically violent narcissists. And it's nearly identical to how Charlene grew up with her Dominican parents. It's, they got off on this. You know, your father was such a feckless, weak, pussy of a man. Pussy of a man that he has to force himself. Force himself. On, on, on women. On his wife. And the thing that your brother could be your dad, and he's going to take a DNA test, because I, so if he's going to take a DNA test to find out that means he had sex with his own, he admits having sex with his own mother. <sighs> you know, uh, I'm, I'm trying to really formulate my words here, but unfortunately, this is not uncommon in that culture. It's just not. And it's some kind of cultural machismo. I, I, I don't know what it is. Okay, and because of it, nar sadistic, sadistic narcissists like this thrive there, thrive there, because there's a culture of silence about it. And it's not any different than how Charlene grew up in her house with, you know, her her sexually abusive mother, her sexually abusive father, her brothers trying to always bust in on her in the bathroom, in the shower, see her. It... So, I mean, I understand. I, mean, I understand these people are just pure, unadulterated evil. But your father's a coward, and he's a feckless nothing of a man. I mean, he's good at beating, he's good at beating on children and people that are smaller than him. Okay, but I, what a, what, what a disgrace. I remember having a beautiful cat. She was going to have babies, so, and I was so excited. My dad found out she was pregnant, and he kicked her across the yard 
as hard as he could. I ran and I comforted her. Mom helped me. When she gave birth to her kittens, they were dead. I will never forget how beautiful those baby kittens looked to me. They were ch chubby little tiger-striped babies. Mom, Mom let me hold one while she dug a hole in the yard to bury them. The next memory was Dad lying in the hospital bed inside my bedroom. He had to urinate through a bag hanging on the side of the bed. My mother cared for him, giving him shots for pain and emptying that pee vat. She should have made him piss himself, okay, and then threw out his pain medication and let the fucker suffer. I never felt any love from my father. As an adult, I always wondered if he loved me. No, he don't love anybody but himself. I remember praying on my hands and knees, asking God to please take him. If someone had, had to die, I hoped it was him. Tony and Isabel flew to Puerto Rico. Dad was on his deathbed and determined to take his secret to the grave. I remember Tony frantically asking my mom for her marriage certificate. She didn't have it, and there was no record of their marriage. Mom was never allowed to write checks, drive, grocery shop, or even go out with friends. Tony and Isabel helped Mom hire a lawyer. They paid Dad a visit at the hospital. On his deathbed, Dad admitted the marriage wasn't legal. They had a quick wedding ceremony right there. Otherwise, I would have been left, Mom and I would have been left with nothing. Dad died in 1979 when I was eight years old. I remember the funeral in vivid detail thanks to Mom. She made the day quite memorable. I walked to his open casket and gave him a kiss goodbye at the urging of the family. I remember my family in the front row crying quietly. We moved on to the burial site, and as the casket was lowered, Mom took a running start and jumped in the grave, screaming and crying. <laughs> I, I, I don't mean. <laughs> my brothers pulled her out with dirt all over her. Tony and Isabel held my hand while I watched, silently detached. I had seen my mom freak out at many funerals, fainting, screaming, and bringing on the drama. Mom could faint anytime she wanted, and she did so in front of me many, many times. I remember how horrible I felt each time it happened. Your mother's a drama sympathy queen. I never had a doubt mom loved me, and I loved her. She often told me she loved me. I eventually became like an only child since the boys were gone, and they were so much older. After dad's death, we moved to Florida, where my golden child brother was living with his wife. Golden child brother began controlling mom just like dad did, but in a more covert way. He controlled the spur of both. He spent her he freely spent her money and made all her decisions. She depended on him for everything. I loved my brother dearly and I thought he loved me. In reality, he hated me. All I was getting I was getting all of mom's attention and a lot of her money went to pay for my Catholic school tuition. I was growing up so fast mom started to have a hard time helping with homework. After third grade I was basically on my own. By now, Mom spoke more English, but not enough to help me with most of my homework. I was still getting straight A's until my second cousin moved in with us. Mom was always depressed after Dad moved to, uh, passed away. She was completely lost. She didn't know how to, how to do basic things like paying bills, grocery shopping, and driving. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere or have any friends over. It was like being in a prison. I even tried to invite a friend over after school. She, she would lose her mind. I wasn't allowed to attend after school activities or enroll in anything. Mr. Rogers from the kids show Mr. Rogers Neighborhood on PBS became my parent and he was a gentle kind and full of knowledge. I often pretended he was my real dad and I loved him more than my real family. R.I.P. Mr. Rogers. I often begged my mom to allow me to have friends or even allow me to visit friends, but it would always cause drama. She might hit me with her shoe or slap me in the face, telling me I don't want you running the streets with a bunch of whores. At the time, I had no idea what the word whore meant. She would blame me for her depression, telling me, threatening to commit suicide if I didn't behave. 
that's it. I'm sick of you. It's just best to kill myself. I'm tired of this life. And you think this woman loved you? This woman didn't love you. She just was, she was just projecting her own frustration back on you. She didn't love you. She would lock herself in her bedroom and I would cry my eyes out in, in, out in front of the door, pleading with her not to do it. She was torturing you and probably laughing at you behind the door, getting all her narcissistic supply. That's what she was doing. She would later, later, she would later quietly unlock the door and I would go in and she would be laying on her bed with the arms crossed, holding her breath. I would bury my head in her chest, begging God to bring her back to life. I just couldn't understand why I was so bad. I was the worst daughter ever. Because she was torturing him. You don't do that to a child. And she liked it. She got off on it. She liked you not, ha not having friends. She liked you being miserable. Because what Charlene's mother did to her is what your mother did to you. Okay, your mother said she's not going to have a better life than I am. She's not going to have it better than me. She's going to be freaking miserable just like I was. My cousin Tina was a, Tita was a lesbian that dressed like a man. She moved from New York to Florida one summer when I was 10 years old. She was so nice to me. She bought me things. She let me practice driving her car. She told me I was her favorite cousin. After spending so much time alone, I was happy to have someone who didn't think I was in the way. I was grateful to finally find someone who actually liked me. Even at school, I was the target for bullies. So Tita was rough and, and tough, and she taught, told me that she could beat up anyone who messed with me. I was happy for the first time in my life, but it didn't last. Cousin Tita also often told me how beautiful I was. She gave me hugs and bought me candy. One day, she spent her entire paycheck on a gold necklace for me. Wow, I couldn't believe it. I was so grateful. One morning, I was getting ready for school, and out of the blue, Tita grabbed my face and stuck her tongue down my throat. I pushed her away in disgust, and she got on her hands and knees and apologized. I promised not to tell if she never let it happen again. The nightmare did not end. Every day, I fought her advantage advances. I burnt her with my curling iron once and she told my mother who then punished me. I knew if my mom, I knew if I told my mom, she would just say it was all my fault. Everything bad was my fault. My mother never talked to me about sex. In her eyes, it was bad. We couldn't even watch a movie without her changing the station if the actor started to kiss. Mom even criticized douche commercials. She was convinced men no longer respected women because they all because they knew all of our private business. I remember think is that why? That, that that's the problem that your mother had douche commercials? Not not a not a rapist family? There's the douche commercials. That that's that's her issue, right? What wrong with that woman? I remember thinking if I ever get married, I won't have kids because I won't die. I would die of embarrassment if I had to tell my mom I was pregnant because that would definitely mean mom knew I had sex. I mean, she just really was screwing with your head. My life was unbearable. Mom being molested, bullies at school, failing my classes, um, burning my cousin with a curling iron. All that, and I was only 11 years old. What could be happening to an 11-year-old that could be so bad? Well, now you know. Nobody bothered to find out. As a matter of fact, at least three adults in the family knew it was happening. They either didn't care or didn't know what to do. Again, more members of the family knew and did nothing. Did nothing. The last grade I completed was, was the fifth. It was all downhill from there. With my behavior and grades so bad, mom thought it would be a good idea to send me to Puerto Rico to spend the summer with another cousin. I remember the morning the flight was leaving. I couldn't do anything right, and mom slapped me across the face before we left to catch the plane. Later on a deathbed, mom actually apologized for abusing me that day. I had totally repressed this memory until mom brought it up. 
So on her deathbed, huh? How about all the other times she slapped you in the face? Just that one? Uh, she had nothing to say about it, about the rest of the abuse. I'm sorry I fucked up your whole life. I, I'm sorry I ruined your whole childhood and 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 sexualized you by friggin' calling you a whore before you even knew what it meant. I went to visit another cousin. She was my mother's sister's daughter. She was in her forties. She had three high school. She had three high school age kids. She had to work. So her 17-year-old son, my second cousin, watched me during the day. We had fun at the beach, and he went surfing. I went swimming. She had a three-bedroom condo. Two boys slept in one room. I was sharing a room with the 17-year-old. The room had a bunk bed. He slept on top. I slept on the bottom. One night around 2 a.m., he jumped on top of me and raped me. There is no, see, this is, this is what the whole family, this is a culture within the family of sexual abuse. It's excused, it's encouraged a lot of times. Sex is almost, rape is used as a punishment. It's used many different reasons. Now, I'm not saying your cousin punished you raped you to punish you. He raped you because he, he wanted to have sex with you and he just felt fucking entitled, okay, because there was no fucking man around to tell him how you treat a woman. Because they raise these feckless little coward men that do this shit. Why do you think your mother really, now, now that makes more sense, why your mother apologized on her deathbed about slapping you in the face. That's not what she was apologizing about. She was apologizing because she knew she was setting you up to get fucking raped by somebody there and teach you a lesson. That's what she was apologizing for. Not slapping you in the face. She slapped you in the face nearly every day of your life, beat you bloody with tree limbs. So why did she apologize that day? Why did she apologize that day? Hmm. Hmm. If you were going to be on your deathbed feeling guilty at your last breath, are you just going to pull out some random slap in the face? No. What did that slap in the face represent? That was her slap in the face before she knowingly set you off to get fucking raped. That's what that was about. Slapped you in the face nearly every day of your life. So why now? Why that one? And that was the one that led you to be sent to Puerto Rico to get raped? That's not what your mother was apologizing for. And you should be even angrier now at your mother because she had the opportunity to do it. She knew what the right thing to do was, and she didn't do it. She still lied through her teeth right to the very end, and she knew what the right thing was to do there. And she didn't do it. <sighs> he put his hand over my mouth and I laid there, frozen in pain, unable to move. I was 11 years old. I had no clue what just happened to me. I was bleeding and my mind and soul were shattered once again. What is it about me that causes people to abuse me? You were born uh, in a narcissistic rape fam family. What did I do to bring this on to myself? You didn't. Your mother set you up for it. Your mother sent you there deliberately hoping this would happen. To teach you a lesson because you were out of control. That's what she was apologizing for on her deathbed. Not some random slap in the face. What did I do to bring this on to myself? God, why? I couldn't tell anyone because it was my fault. No, it wasn't. I went back home more broken than ever with nobody to turn to. I would sit in class and just stare in the space. Bad grades, office referrals, bullies. Calls home only made matters worse. I ran away from home only to be brought right back to the same crap. 
Eventually, my golden child brother talked my mom into giving me up. I was deemed ungovernable and made a ward of the state till my 19th birthday. I ran away from group home to group home till at 13 I had the unfortunate luck of meeting a 40 year old narcissistic pedophile pimp. This is the part of the story that brings incredible shame to me. Even now, 33 years later, I can't bear to talk or write about it. I know I need to, so once, so I can once and for all get rid of it. In the future, I'll add a part two to my story. I can't begin to tell you how difficult it was to, to talk bad about my family in this email, but things weren't that bad is what I keep telling myself, although I knew they were. To all the beautiful men and women out there who have been sexually abused as a child or an adult, I feel your pain. I see you, I care. To you, I dedicate my story in the hopes that it may help someone, anyone. Listen to your kids, watch all adults around them. Please ask questions, believe your children, if they tell. Thank you for listening to my story, Bella. None of this is your fault. I think you kind of realize that now. Bella, if you get nothing else out of this video, understand your mother sent you to Puerto Rico with the intention of something bad happening to you, and it did, to teach you a lesson. Because that's how those type of Latino men teach their women a lesson. That's how Charlene's father did it. I've heard too many goddamn stories, the same ilk. Not to this, this is. Why would your mother have apologized for a slap in the face that day when she slapped you repeatedly throughout your life? Why that one on her deathbed? Because she knew. She set you up for all of this. She destroyed you from, from childhood and it was, it's the same thing like Charlene's mother. I had it bad, so you're going to have it bad too. But you had it worse. They always do. These things don't get better generation to generation. They only get worse. But they can never see it. Because they can never feel what we feel. So no matter how bad we hurt or how bad they hurt us or how broken we are, they will never see it because it's only about themselves. It was always about your mother. I don't believe her to be this innocent victim past what happened to her in her childhood. Throwing herself on her father's car. Get the fuck out of here. You should have been like, fine, bitch, stay down there. Get the shovel, bury him. Two for the price of one, be done with it. You'd have been much better off, sweetheart. You'd have been much better off. Thank you for your contribution. Thank you for your story. Thank you to everybody who's watched. Any opinions or advice, please leave it in the comments section below. And again, if you want your story read on the channel, you know what to do. PayPal links in the description box. I'll have it right out to you. This is Ollie Matthews. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all again soon. Bye.